actually access in Africa. I think the latest I saw was 21%. It's always between 21 and 23% that I always see, which is like terrible. So the, um, the goal of this conversation, which I aim that would not be between me and just the panelists, but you also would voice your opinions, is to increase knowledge around the challenges that we face in Africa for wide-scale inclusion and what should be um, those policy interventions that we should begin to give attention to around increasing digital inclusion in Africa or bridging the divide, which is, you know, like, um, generally uh, um, the gap in access and use of ICTs. And again, to also begin to look at the collaborations that are important um, in order to scale these hurdles and see that we, we have digital solutions that address our context and solve the problems um, around the divide that we face. So that's the, that's the broad goal of the panel. Um, of the conversation, because if I just keep saying panel, then I think you realize that, that we're only going to be four who are going to be having this conversation, but you are part of the conversation and we really want your voice included. So um, I'm going to invite Chioma, who is the founder of Tech Arab Community of Learning and Support and Collaboration for Women Working with Technology to join me on the panel. I'm going to invite Akiremi Peter Taiwo, Coordinator, African Civil Society on Information Society, ACSIS. I'm going to invite Jumoke Adekeye, who is Abuja Global Shape and Director of Employability and Entrepreneurship Program. Um, they seek to democratize access to jobs and startups for young Nigerians. And I will also invite Ponslet Leleji, who is the coordinator of the Gambian YMCA's Computer Training Center and Digital Studio. Please give a round of applause to my panelists. Thank you very much for being nice. So, um, uh, thank you again for joining me. And I think the way this is going to work is maybe I'll go around the question and then we'll just open it up because we really don't have much time and we'll see if we can come back to have some final closing points. But uh, um, with Chairman, I'll start with Chairman because you're sitting down there. So there is kind of like a consensus about the benefits of ICTs and nobody argues that, you know, internet is like a right right now. Um, but it's, what, what I find, you know, um, is around making the case that this is this should be um, this should be priority at the highest levels of government um, and also to set the strategic and specific targets around um, around inclusion you know and also we also find that problem even on the other side of the private sector to make the business case um, for, for them to you know kind of like open open their options to areas or populations that are typically least likely to have access or adopt, you know. So I wanted to just pick your thoughts around that uh, because for, for me, that's one thing that I find that is a constant challenge now that we're talking about challenges around why we continue to have this huge gap and what we should be looking at in terms of price. So, you know, just I, I wanted to pick your thoughts on that. What is that thing with the business case that makes it not a priority for government, not a priority for private sector, not a priority for anyone who seems to be an actor? Because I think that is really huge. Um, so, good morning again, everyone. Um, so, I think that digital inclusion in itself must be defined according to the particular circumstances that obtain it in place. Right? And that definition starts from things like, what other rights pertain? Does Nigeria have human rights? Right? Because, I mean, if you look at, the, at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have food, shelter, you know, um, clothing, and then as he becomes comfortable on certain levels, then he starts to advance. If we take Nigeria, 180 million people today, what is the percentage of us who have moved beyond food, shelter, and clothing? Right? So when we start to think about digital inclusion, we must first find out, do we have, are there any other rights that we can hold on to? Are there any other rights that become the pacemaker? Okay, this is how we achieve this. Therefore, this is a route to that. The other thing I'm going to say, and I think this speaks directly to your question about 
why probably we're not seeing the uptake that we expect is that we should ask ourselves the question digital inclusion for what right um, if we take Kenya which has become you know the shining light for all things inclusion um, and we break down digital inclusion to mean financial inclusion because we have financial we have social you know and we have health and all of these things can come under the nice umbrella of digital but if we take Kenya for instance there was a need moving money around in a way that protected people ensured speed you know um, ensured spontaneity etc so then they met that need using it using a pesta what is the need we're trying to meet on the list of you know on the list of, um, of issues or challenges that nigeria has today which one will digital inclusion meet and in meeting that need how does it benefit the person we're trying to use so for instance we're going through you know corporate or private sector what is the benefit to them because the truth is they're the people who are altruistic so the people who will do something just for the good of it you can count them on one hand in the entire country and it's not to say everyone else is bad it's just coming back to that whole thing about needs you cannot be trying to meet everyone else's needs and yours aren't met regardless of money and money is a piss poor um, reward in a lot of cases so it's, it's, a, it's about you know two things one digital inclusion for what what is the need is it security would there be a greater uptake if we say security and not just in the northeast number two you know what is the definition of our own inclusion and how can we walk towards achieving that based on the peculiar circumstances that we have here great i was avoiding passing you know too much of my I, I really do think those are great points, you know, and there's this, uh, there's this, there's a thing that, you know, like you said, you know, bread, bed, and then broadband, you know, food, clothing, shelter, and then all other things, you know, and, but there was a panel here yesterday that I was listening to, and someone was making a point, the panel on artificial intelligence and human rights, and someone was making the point of how we always leave these things to the rest of the world, and once everything is done and shipped, and we've had all the decisions made for us that we're trying to catch up because we always say oh give me food first i'm just so hungry but now artificial intelligence seems to be determining where food is going and how we are perceived you know in terms of crime and every other thing else you know so yeah i think that is an important point that you made about also tying it in to what yeah to solve problems and what are our challenges um, Peter, you are you you are the coordinator of the African Society and Information Society, yeah. And I, I wanted to also pick your thoughts about, um, you know, it, it seems like the population that is yet to be reached is the hardest to reach, yeah. And I wanted to I wanted to just also pick your thoughts about that as the rest of society forges ahead. You know, what, what do you think are the new th solutions that we should be considering? Because it looks like everyone who will be reached is already reached. And those who are not reached are kind of like the hardest to reach. And it looks like everything that we're doing is still not reaching them. But in your experience and your work, what do you think we should be thinking about in terms of how to reach this like hardest to reach populations, these populations that are least likely to adopt? Thank you very much. Good morning to us. Well, it's part of what I listed as a point that uh, I really want to discuss about uh, what uh, we're passing through in Africa. But like she rightly said, that digital inclusion we need to define it. Because to me as a technical person, digital inclusion means different thing. To a user, it means another thing. Perception about digital inclusion, but what does it mean? Now, we have 78, let me see, yeah, 78, exclusion, digital exclusion in Africa, 1.2 billion population, but we have just 21% uh, uh, penetration. So, this takes me, when I look at the rest of the world, and I see that they leverage on different kind of technology, to reach their people. But in Africa, I notice that what we do is we over dependent on one solution. All of us, we are talking about Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. We know that it is easily to design, it is easily to set up. 
What are we talking about our fiber optic? All our cable that has been laid uh, across the sea, what are we doing about it? Now, what are we talking about um, satellite technology, which has no border? Now, that brought me back to these questions that do we really have a connected policy to address this issue? In Africa, we do things in isolation. Now, all of us, we had only, and now, like my, my daddy normally told me that, you know, a, a, a tree cannot make a forest. You are fighting digital inclusion in Africa. Eastern Africa is fighting digital inclusion in Africa. I was sharing with Consulate the, uh, yesterday that I don't even know whether he has already addressed the solution, what I wanted to address. We are not connected. Our policy is not connected. It is high time for Africa to come together and be connected uh, in policy. Because that is where it will be replicated from. That's the common goal we are fighting. Without that, we are still not, we will not be able to, to fight digital inclusion. Now, different technology, we need to look into it. Wi-Fi technology, satellite technology, fiber optics, that's broadband. We need to tap into this. Now, the rest of the world are ahead of us in technology. They are talking about 4G, 5G. What are we talking about in uh, Africa? But what I am saying is this. Even if we don't have that technology to go uh, 3G gaga, let us start from little one that everyone can be able to connect. Because if you are able to connect, that is when I will now be talking about I need 5G. I need 4G. Because I have seen the benefits. What are the benefits that is tied to digital inclusion? Now, our policy maker, the don't, add, let me say, they really have a narrow-minded about digital inclusion. They are just mount saying. We are not really implementing it. So, our policy maker needs to be connected across to LGAs. Because that's, that's where we can fight. They are the top. They are in Abuja. They are doing the policy. But who is fighting it on the ground? The policy needs to be replicated from above down to the, to the stream. We need to have a common goal. We need to unite different technology to reach. If I cannot afford broadband, let me use Wi-Fi. If I cannot afford broadband, it is a satellite like Axis. We just uh, uh, initiated, we, we partner with some organization in abroad that is looking at a mega constellation, constellation of satellites, you know, to, to bring services to least developed you know, countries and Africa as a whole. For digital services, those are the things we are looking at, and we are partnering, we are influencing policy at the level that adopt different technology so that we can we can reach where we need to reach. We don't need to be over dependent. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. You, you made a striking point about having a policy that is comprehensive and you know, like all these efforts in silos and ad hoc and sometimes without even budgetary allocation it's just one program here one program here to be seen as doing something or in silos without any collaboration or impact of and then the, also the importance of having of also you know because you know he said something like just in a sentence but it stuck with me like we do all our advocacy at the highest level and we had, we hardly like um, look at municipal governments and state governments and local governments, whatever it is that we call it in our different countries. But like the um, LCDAs, and you know, we we always just always talk up to the the highest government. I I, I think that that's an important point to make as well. Um, Jumoke, when I saw that your background was in statistics, like you are a yeah, I was because there's a, I have a burning question around measurement. Because you cannot grow what you don't measure, right? And it's like we always depend on all this like international comparisons and benchmarking and wondering if we are really measuring what we should be measuring in Africa. Actually, in my own opinion, I don't think that ICT data exists like that, that is empirical, that is that informs decision about what the gap is and what the priorities should be and what, what the strategies should be. But I wanted to pick your thought about that, you know, um, because if we want to challenge 
governments and decision makers as a broader term to use to action and we are not measuring and data doesn't exist and we're using international benchmarking you know what do you think we should be measuring that we are not measuring that might be informing this gap in policy intervention or the fact that we are talking so much and we're moving so little thank you for that question it's a million dollar question if i may say um, but i think i think that's a very valid point um, that we often um, base our statistics on what um, you know, the, let's say, international organizations, GS, GSMA, um, and perhaps some, you know, the Telecoms Association publish. But I think it's a start. I think we need to, um, so before directly answering your question, we need to recognize the way that our policymakers in Nigeria and other countries on the continent actually take decisions. The truth is, it's a hard truth, but it's not data-driven decision-making, right? There is the context of politics. And so I think it, the owner, so I, I should also say that I'm a development professional um, and specifically been working also in the health field and lessons that are transferable um, to the ICT sector, if you may, if I may, is that we need to recognize and understand um, what happens in the corridors of power. What are the, I won't call them backdoor politics, but really understanding who the key stakeholders are. And we mentioned, you know, the, the um, focus on, uh, on, in Nigeria at least, on national level um, policy makers. But the reality is that, um, you know, in, in many ways we run a decentralized system. So you can have a national policy but then implementation really has, happens at the state level. Um, and so maybe it's not just enough to say, um, or rely on statistics that says, um, for instance, that um, right now to get one gigabyte um, of data um, is about 5% of uh, the minimum wage in Nigeria, but if you compare that data to Egypt, um, and South Africa, and Morocco, it's less than less than two percent, which is the um, uh, which is right within the uh, limit of the I think it's the Africa uh, Affordable Initiative that Nigeria just signed on to in 2017. And so we have we have that benchmark, and we, we can talk about what we want to see in Nigeria, but then it's I think it, it's behooves us to begin to shift our focus from what is the obvious, okay, go to the national level, have a national policy, have a national broad, broad, uh, broadband policy, which expires in 2018, right? And then begin to say, okay, this, these are the lessons we've learned. We've seen that they have been bottlenecks where we've been working. Now let's move to the states. And so in the healthcare field, there is always the legal framework that's set at the national level, but then implements and start working at state level. And then you begin to see which states are championing different initiatives. And I think that um, for the ICT sector, that's something that's very critical. Um, so to come back to um, your, your points about you know, what's the, what data should we be collecting, how should we be collecting it, I, mean, I think it's also fundamental who is collecting the data and are, are they prioritized? Who is prioritizing um, the data collection? We recognize that a lot of the progress that has been made in Nigeria as far as digital rights or digital inclusion is from civil society, private sector, private sector interests. And so you begin to find that those are the entities that are creating and generating data. I think um, you know, from the, uh, the previous sessions that I've, I've listened to, it's, it's clear that um, there needs to be more citizen advocacy um, in the sense that people are putting pressure on their um, policy makers um, at different levels, just not national, sub-national, state levels, specifically, for instance, in, in Nigeria, um, to prioritize this. If I may um, bring in this, uh, at least part of what the Global Shapers um, do, one of the, the, the programs that I'm leading is Employability and Entrepreneurship Program. And we have a component that is digital literacy. Um, and it's recognizing that, you know, we're talking about digital inclusion. It's important that people can live life with dignity in the 21st century world, not having access to um, information uh, technology, so ICT, um, is a disadvantage 
for the young people that we work with, it means that they're not aware of job opportunities. It means that they do not have the skill sets, right, in 21st century to actually earn a living, to get food and shelter and clothing. And so you all begin to see a widening of an already deep socioeconomic gap. Um, and so that's the social case. For the business case, I think it's also important to recognize that we're, so in a country like Nigeria, uh, we have about, what, 67 million people uh, between the ages of 15 and 35, 45, so youth, right? That's almost the size of, that's essentially the, the UK um, population, right? We have a critical mass who, um, many of them are about 50%, you know, some say out of jobs. Well, they need skills. Where are they going to get the skills? We have an education system that has failed them. ICT provides an opportunity to leapfrog, right, um, in, in building their skill sets and granting them socioeconomic opportunities. So I think that where we may have different definitions, where there might be fundamental, um, you know, rights and in terms of or, or needs, we need to recognize that technology can accelerate bridging the gap um, that we're seeing. It, it can help us. You know, where we are, traditional education systems may have failed, you know, having massive online open courses that are available on, on smartphones, you know, um, is really, really key. So that's the demand side. I think a lot of the conversation has been on the supply side, uh, but I think that we need to also record, really uh, put emphasis on both the demand side and the supply side. And by supply, I mean the infrastructure um, that you were talking about, broadband, um, you know, where there were and things like that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jumoke. I think that um, for me, the absence of national ICT, because you're talking about the bodies that collect it, and no matter how much we collect data as civil society organization or um, whatever organizations we are that are interested in these issues, I think the absence of national ICT data, they already see that the question we have asked is a question that you already determined the answer and the question your methodology and you know the, just the rigor of that you went into the study and you know you are you people are troublemakers and like boys said in the last panel you are busy bodies so yeah this you know but i think that we should also in, in conversations we'll have and in speaking to like the future of this panel where i was talking about solutions and collaborations we should really begin to look at um what we can do in, in that area to come to Mr. Ponsolet, and then I would open up the panel for all of you to have contributions and ask your questions. Um, I'm so glad that you're here and you're Gambian and you're not Nigerian and I'm wondering how I put together this panel that everyone is a Nigerian, but I hope that we can, we can talk about context, you know. Um, I just wanted to ask, so you do what you do, yeah, I think because you recognize, I, I know that you've done a lot of work in, in the area of digital rights, but I think that you do what you do because you recognize that access still comes first. Yeah, and I wanted to just, you know, in your experience in the Gambia, what would you say should be the policy focus for addressing the low numbers, you know, when it comes to, yeah, so because um, you find a lot of arguments about the, you know, coverage to rural areas or whether it should be faster mobile solutions, and you know, um, and some people have talked about social context to um, divide and things like level of skills and education and what people really can do with access. So I wanted to I wanted you to talk to your experience in Gambia and you know what what you think the policy focus should be in your context and your experience around um, bridging the gap and you know raising these low numbers that we continue to record on the continent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I like to say when we look at um, um, digital inclusion. We are using technology uh, basically to create social inclusion. And um, what we try to do, uh, to me, the best way to put it is let me just describe a small scenario on how people have got out of poverty through using technology. Because this is one thing giving access and what you do with access. Um, I have a um, anthropology um, a friend of mine. He always comes to the Gambia um, every summer. Um, the Gambia is very unique that uh, he does a lot of research on Christian and Muslim harmony. 
know, when I go through the national ICT policy, I realize that indeed they recognize digital gender divide. But women, you know, the word women was only mentioned twice. No specific program that targets women and girls in uh, national ICT policy. And I believe that maybe going forward, if we want to engage our uh, uh, federal communication uh, technology on this issue, we should be able to tell them that, look, have specific program targeting women and girls in order for us to have high, high, high uh, rate of uh, women and girls in, in ICT. Now, on the issue of you know solving all these problems, I don't know. Like for me, I there was a time I, I need to adopt it, an ICT center in order for, for us to bring young people to this center. But we realized that uh, at the end of the day, I met with Linda and then. All of a sudden, I saw on national TV that NIDA is partnering with another private company and then the company needs to pay a certain amount of, of money. So, I believe as civil society, we should look at the solution. Even if it is only one ICT center or a resource center that we can, we can engage with at a time, then we can solve the issue of you know, having, having uh, poor, poor people at the community level having access to ICT and internet. So, in, for me, we are we are creating now in Nigeria what I call internet elites. We have, you know, we have more of people who are at the urban centers having access to ICT, and whereas we are making some people poor. So I believe that my my role is not to, to just stay in Abuja and then be enjoying ICT. Let me just go to one rural community and do and do my work. And finally, I I want us to look at. You know the issue of uh, uh, what is it now? Uh, I did mention of something last year, in the US, which is the issue of education training and orientation. We are training the wrong people, and then we are educating also the wrong people. This, I, as civil society, are of course to you know differentiate who to reorientate, who to educate, who to empower in training. Thank you. Make your comments really brief. We have to uh, yeah, be very brief. Set the point very brief as brief as possible. One thing as many as people as possible. Thank you. Goodbye, my name is Goodbye, my silver sword. I want to. We are talking about the inclusion, and uh, whatever we are talking about, you know, the, the, the technologies and all that, everything is depending on energy. And over here, I mean power. Over here, for instance, take Nigeria as a case. Uh, we have a very serious problem. We are talking about the rural people whom they describe as the bottom of the pyramid. Those are the bottom of the pyramid. They are not, they're not connected to the grid. If we depend on grid uh, electricity, we are already excluded. So what are we doing? What can be done? Uh, in, uh, think, using things like renewable energy to make sure that we want to get to those at that level. You know, we need a different arrangement. Uh, today we're talking about off grid. So what uh, intervention can be you know, made available uh, for in, in terms of this uh, power in that area that will take care of those people in the rural area and those at the bottom of the pyramid? Thank you. Okay. okay. Good morning. Sorry. Yes, uh, my name is Fernando. You want to debate your name? So um, I just have uh, two questions. I work in rural setting, and basically uh, they're talking about just internet. I think to me the talk is not just about access, accessing the internet, but we've not really talked about access to the common communication that we're talking about uh, in terms of just phone call. And you see most of our rural areas, they are having this challenge of access to just this common. Um, so, and for me, I feel that having access to it, just the core, will solve quite a lot of our problems. But most of the communities don't have access to this. So I want to just know, which factors do we always consider, maybe, if only the telecom companies were here, I think that would have been much uh, better. But I think with, with the panelists, they can be able to help us in, in answering this. Now, what 
factors do we always consider in citing some of these, uh, let me say, mass and other things like that in rural settings? Do you always consider the population? Or what do you always consider? Do you understand? And then, of course, uh, I, I, I believe communication is a universal right. It's on the needs of that way. So if it's a right, then we have to do something better and see that every kind of failure of our communities are connected on this. Then if we are able to have that, then you know, internet access will be So thank you. Okay, good morning. My name is Obey Um Of course, I, this, mine is small, like a, more or less like a cop. I, of course, I work in a rural environment, also in a rural setting. And um, I had to quit my job, my high paying job, to relocate to Panagri, Lagos State, just to actually promote um, digital inclusion and of course digital uh, education amongst youth and children. Because um, that environment is more like a marginalized environment with um, five crude worlds. Now, Lagos State is listed as the oil producing state. The five worlds in Panagri. And if you go there, human capital development zero, infrastructural development zero. And uh, we are not talking, I mean, I, I, we are taking proactive decisions to look into, of course, preventing, I mean, and circumventing potential conflicts like we are currently facing in Niger Delta. Because if these guys do not have these trainings, if they don't have exposure to, and if they feel marginalized, I think um, we may be set, I mean, we'll be sitting on time bomb. And that's why we had to go there to start doing that across the two communities. And of course, policies are quite important, but implementing policies is much more important. There are, there are laws, there are some of the policies that could actually protect the interests of these people as of now, but of course implementation is zero. So I'm just calling out on private initiative and any other, I mean, every other social, I mean, um, civil society organization here to, I think we need to collaborate more to um, prevent um, um, what's possible conflict in the environment by helping the government. Because if we wait for the government, we would not be able to do anything. In the last three years that we have been doing, I mean, that we have been there, from government officials, from their representatives, there is zero support. I mean, no support. We had to just encourage ourselves on the team to be able to do that. So I'm calling out on, of course, a program initiative. I know you are doing an amazing job in Nigeria, but I think we can actually do much more in that environment so that, I mean, we can circumvent um, possible conflicts. Okay. Yeah, I'll take two more comments. There's one hand I saw on the table. There's one hand I saw on the table behind. And that table, I'm so sorry we have five questions. Mine is This is digital. Yeah, so, yeah, I just want to clarify. You know this guy? All right, thank you. My name is Afis. I know we can start asking that question within our minds. Yes, the government, I want to be pessimistic. Our government, the kind of people that we have, yeah, don't want everybody in the community. Now, but we have to keep on the question. Now, the level at which we are now, I must be sincere with us, it is not the activity of the government. It is actually the effort of NGOs, like Paradigm Ministry, and a lot that are based in Africa. Now, but we are not doing enough. And why do I say that? A lot of figures are banded up, up and down. For example, Nigeria, our, our president, he said we are 180 million. But prior to that particular day, he made a statement. The chairman of his own commission, the National Commission, said we are 198 million. And another organization, what do you mean, was saying we are 194 million. Another organization was saying we are 190. Now, what is the point? The point is, if we are saying we have 21 percent penetration in Africa, it is wrong. I am very sure. The reason being that most of these figures that we talk about in Africa, we don't actually have the data. Now, when you go to most of these rural areas, some of them are actually connected with the internet. But who is capturing their data? Now, what are they using the connection for? Those are the questions we should be asking ourselves. Now, we are in this. We are working a lot with school children, especially the senior classes. When they order to start the white registration, the jam, what have, what have you, then I asked a lot of them to give me their email. Most of them do have. So I started opening emails for them. Now, most of them have phones. They are connected to the internet. They are on Facebook, but they don't have email. Perhaps you forgot anyway. Now, what do they use the connection for? Now, most of them only use the connection to go on Facebook to do 
because of people who are Facebook. But they don't actually know the importance of being on the internet. Now, in one of our sessions that we organized, we have trained about 1,500 students on internet and some other usages. Now, I made them realize that there are a whole lot of benefits you can get on the internet. You can make a lot of money on the internet. Not just depending on until I finish school, then I will use my certificate to have a good job. So, now, the challenge before us, which I want all NGOs to be to take up, we have someone that's on the for local government in Nigeria. How many of our NGOs are based in these rural communities? So, it is not just a matter of staying in Lagos, not just a matter of staying in Port Harcourt, or Abuja, or Ibadan. And you say you, are, you want to connect the rural community. It's a matter of all of us going down. And I believe that by doing that, like Mr. Postgate, I hope I get the pronunciation correctly, like it's doing over there, if most of these NGOs are in these local communities, then we encourage them to take up the connection on the internet so that it can be transforming their, transforming their lives and socially and economically. Thank you. Already on I'm the really mic. sorry, we are going to have to end this. Which I believe the digital um, inclusion means to me access, um, adoption, and application. But these all depends on something very important: pricing and in, um, sorry, pricing and effectiveness. We have in Nigeria where the, um, the the service providers tend to tell you that they give you this data for this little price, but they never work. So I think they should also look at, when looking at um, digital inclusion, they should look at policies that would help us um, make these service providers reduce the pricing for the data so that we can actually um, get it affordably and also it becomes effective. Because if I buy and it doesn't work for me, then it is nothing. So I think the policies should include pricing and effective, um, sorry, pricing and effectiveness. All right, thank you so much. So now for the closing thoughts of this panel, um, please feel free to address the questions you want to. I think the last one, you know, to me is around regulation. Um, whether what we've done around competition and open market is enough. Um, I've also had questions around stimulation of consumption and local content. Um, I've heard questions about Africa being black literally in terms of power and how this affects and also more concerns around um, what we could be doing more as advocates beyond engaging with policy and how we can collaborate more with existing efforts amongst ourselves, our initiatives and then also existing efforts. Um, Tick Tech, which is one of the foremost gatherings for civic tech um, in, the, in the world. I attended that recently and someone, um, Martha Lane Fox, was saying that in the UK there are about 10 million people who are digitally excluded, some of them voluntarily, some of them involuntarily. So some people have said, I don't want to be connected to the internet. And that is their right, right? And you must, you, must, you must meet them at that point. So that's the first thing I'm going to say. Uh, but then, on top of that, answering the question about you know, uh, where do we go from here. Um, the truth is, Nigeria is 180 million people. Paradigm initiative is not enough to cater to 100 million people. The truth is, there must be demands placed on government who have the sole responsibility to oversee you know, the, the activities and you know, the, the public services that get to these 180 million, whether it's 180 million or 190, 194, or two people, you know, whatever they say. And so there's that. Um, and, and so if we then start to think about how do we work going forward, it's, I've heard at least three or four organizations mentioned here today. How are we latching on to what other people are doing? Um, somebody talked about Africa is working in isolation. No, Abuja is working in isolation. I did a project with some people a few years ago, and there were at least four different organizations working on female genital mutilation in Abuja who didn't know each other. So, yes. So, how are we working with each other? Let's leave Africa. We're in Nigeria today. How many of us within this room are aware of what the next person is doing? Because we end up duplicating efforts and, you know, expending resources that we don't even have. So, for instance, have we found out if Paradigm is doing something close to Badagri before we go and start up something brand new? Have we found out, do you know, those kinds of things? So, as far as going forward is concerned, I've got just one thing, which is find out who else, what can I latch on to? If I'm bringing rice, can somebody else bring beans rather than all of us take rice to the community and they have nothing to put it in? Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you. Well, another thing.
thing I want to say is collaboration is expensive. Development is expensive. You want to collaborate, you have to be willing to do that and spend your resources. Okay. Now, I want to address the issue of communication that he made mention of. Uh, that could only be done if we use different technology. Because, you know, our landscape is different. We need to employ this different kind. And these people are profit oriented. They are not just doing it, they want to make money, they want to make profit. If you ask them to go to my village, where there are no population, would they go? They will not. So, government need to step forward, need to get involved, let us collaborate. We know that they are not ready to listen. We need to put pressure on them. Another thing about energy, we are talking, we are talking, there are different technologies that can give us energy. But we are not just taking the advantage of it. Now, solar is there, grid is there, everything, let us make research. Our institution needs to stand up. Let us tell us what is the because now if you go to a businessman and say, sir, we want to take power today, okay, what can I get from him? If you can make profit from it, then you will go to that village. So, that's another thing. Another factor in digital inclusion, it varies. But we need to come. Now, digital inclusion to you, it's very. Those factors, we need to bring them together, connect it together, and find a solution to it. Another thing we need to address is mapping. Where are we lucky behind in digital literacy? Whether in Abuja we, we, it is 50 penetration, in Lagos 90 penetration, each leg, uh, local government, I, I listen to some things over there in abroad, they call all the stakeholders from all the regions and they display the data indicators. I was marveled. I was like, can we do this in, in Nigeria? Do we have the right indicator, the right data to say in Ajebule it's only four people that is connected? Let us go there in 15 days. These people should be able to, you know, be connected. Another thing we need to appreciate benefit to it. We, we just don't talk, and USA, someone was saying something about skills. You can have these skills and lack the understanding of using those skills. Many of us will go to university will study computer science, but I will be asking myself, how can I even attach I uh, add values to life? Because I don't know. You don't have the understanding. We need to have that understanding. And now another thing I want to tell you. And now in this country, we are, let me say we are maybe like 50 or thereabout. If you can affect one life and tell the person about digital literacy, you can empower the person and the person will go ahead and empower them. Do you know that that will be replicated? But all of us will just sit down and do nothing we like talking and we like blaming government. But these are the things we need to address. Am I ready to take action? Are you ready to take action? If all of us can go back to our community and replicate and tell someone about this and train the person. So what, what are we saying? We will not be here. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Very brief. Um, so I think I, I focus on two things, two potential next steps. Um, I think this is a great conversation, a light touch to raise the different issues. But I think concretely next steps is to have perhaps smaller brainstorming workshop sessions. It was great to see that we have grassroots organizations and really um, look at and map through what the gaps are. Um, also ensure that different organizations um, are sharing their lessons and learn that's what Shona was saying about um, you know really having um, discussions and knowing what one organization is doing. Um, I think actually what we can do to institute that we can set up a, a partner landscape, you know, have a website where organizations that are working on digital inclusion register what they're doing. So put your information, your location, map it. I mean, so I think it's it's a, a very concrete step. So you can see in the different countries on the continent and the different and the different levels, this is what's happening. Um, and then we know who is working in different areas and can have them as resources. I think that um, 
one thing that's also important, the final thing I would say is that to uh, recognize that technology is an enabler, but technology is not a panacea. And sometimes we think, oh, we give, I think the point has been made already, we, we give access to technology and um, therefore we would have, we'll see social benefits or economic benefits. It's recognizing that it's an enabler. That also means that the ICT space also needs to plug into different development spaces um, who have you know, in a country like Nigeria, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years of experience working with government and doing other things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shumaka. Mr. Ponson. Um, I think from all what I've listened to, I would say that um, one thing I've noticed is those Africans, we are very lazy in terms of research. <laughs> so, basically, <laughs> that kind of thing. That's why um, when um, Chairman was talking about um, three people doing the same FGM projects, because they just sat down there, woke up one morning, no research, and then they decided to do it. So we have, I'm always talking about data, people are complaining about data. The data is there. We don't, government, the big projects, no matter how we might decide the government in any African country, the big projects, they have some certain figures of data, they have some certain figures of number of people going to school, whether it's Madrasa education and all those things. So, if you are working in a particular area, in relation to maybe the digital education, you can work in a particular community, or go to the Ministry of Education, it's at the local level, you talk to people, you can get certain data. And you can now aggregate that data and see whether the data makes sense or not. So I think we, we have to we have to be very realistic here about um, how we want to move ahead. And then the last thing, I don't believe um, that African um, well, everybody puts a lot of body on governments. What I see here, that in Little Gambia that has 22 years of dictatorship, you ask the average Gambian on, on the street before your air German left, what was this problem? They can tell you that they just wanted an enabling environment. So now we have a government that has created that enabling environment. People are able to do things with policies that in place. So what I look at Nigeria, I think to some a large extent is an enabling environment. They are setting policy documents, but people don't read those policy documents and they expect governments to act. You know? So we we have to we um, my last comments, I will emphasize again, do your research very well and collaborate and look at government as partners. Look at government, always look at government. In the heated days of the Gambia, I remember when I was president of the IT Association and um, WhatsApp was banned and everything was banned, we had to use the VPN and my colleagues approached me, they said, no, constantly you have to write, you have to write. You know, the president of the controls the gate. So I wrote a letter about all these services being blocked, sky, WhatsApp, and all this stuff. And I was invited to the National Intelligence Agency. So they first kept me there for two hours, nobody talked to me. And then when someone came and talked to me, he said, No, we just wanted to ask somebody a uh, question. You know, if you open all this, you open all this, it's all about benefits. I said, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prophet. Thank you, everyone. I think this has been really educated. For, for those who, you know, kind of like asked questions about um, program initiative, like coming to the environment or like why are we all talking about policy and government? You know, I actually began to feel all over again like when Wari said Nigerian youth are lazy. Yeah, because, you know, and that's why it's very important to have conversation around policy. And like Mr. Ponslet said, um, it's very important that we do our research and we, we do, um, like, we have, our advocacy is informed. And we are not just emotional about picking on issues. And Parker Initiative is in five locations in Nigeria. We have three training centers. And then, oh, everybody's in Abuja. Well, I'm in Kano and in Aba, and I'm training. Um, I'm not, I, I don't want to make a mistake about the numbers, but I can tell you that I'm training an average of 400 
young people every year, many of them who have never seen a computer or touched it. And by the time they are done, they can at least design a simple website, they can use social media for making money, and I'm not in Abuja here. You know, like this is a conversation I have with policymakers and I'm pained when I'm leaving. Because I come to you and I give you this, and I, and I discuss research and, 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 and I'm trying to you know, make this a policy priority for you. And you say to me, why are you in Abuja? Why don't you go to the rural area and do this? And, and I'm just weak because I'm like, why are you a policy maker? Do you even understand what policy making is? Or you are just a career politician who has been to very little school but wants to make a lot of money off people all the same. So we shouldn't actually, you know, sound like that as well. We should know our, you know, we should know our stuff, you know, and a lot of things have been said here, but I think I want to highlight a few things that stood up. One is research. I think we should look more in the area of research. I think we should look more in the area of working together. You know, like Paradigm Initiative, we quickly came to realize that we are not government. And we are not going to be able to build centers everywhere and equip it with computers. It, like 60% of our operational budget, which runs into millions every year, is around power. And we are just one organization. And we're talking to state governments to say, you know what, we want to have into this, our curriculum, we'll deliver our exact curriculum in your schools. You know, so it doesn't have to be paradigm building centers everywhere, but we can collaborate with people who are already doing things and we can all work together to deepen our interventions. But beyond what we are doing in the area of capacity building, I think we should work more in the area of research and advocacy. The policy interventions that we have highlighted today are critical to look at you know, in terms of how we talk to government to make the business case for, for deepening um, the internet penetration and access and adoption of ICTs generally, um, the things we have talked about around stimulating adoption and local content, the things we have talked around about our own numbers, not just international benchmarking and all of that, but really looking at, you know, um, ICT data being empirical and being sex segregated and using that you know, to engage. I think that those are the things that we should begin to look at. You know, many of us do digital rights on the side, but we have all this passion around just making sure that ICTs are adopted. And I think that we need to harness that more. So thank you very much for being in this conversation. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, and let's keep uh, talking around this. Thank you. Thank you.